Welcome back. It's Tony Robbins again here with Money Master the Game, Seven Simple Steps to Financial Freedom. Let's get into gear now. We've given you the background and the overview of what this book is really about. Let's go through the seven steps by beginning with step number one, tap the power. In this session, we're going to make the most important financial decision of your life. And it's not a decision you might think it is. In fact, most people think that the way you get free, financially free or wealthy, is you get this big score. Somehow I'm going to make a bunch of money or somehow I'm going to make this investment in Apple and it's going to triple and that's what's going to make me wealthy. But all the research shows in reality, people earn a huge sums of money, rarely keep those huge sums of money. And very few people really get to the number that they're really after when they're trying to make that big score. And so I really want to show you a much simpler way. There are literally millions of people around the world that have become millionaires and they've done it really slowly and easily because they've just tapped into a very simple power and that power I know you've heard of called compound interest or compounded growth. The idea of growth upon growth, multiplying itself. Let me explain what I mean. I, early in the book, I decided one of the people I wanted to go visit with was a man named uh, Burton Malkiel. Burton Malkiel, or Bert, is an amazing professor who's at Princeton, and I wanted to go see him because he wrote a book that's become kind of an investing classic called A Random Walk Down Wall Street, and he wrote it in the 70s, and it's still popular today, and in it, he kind of shook up the investment field because he came up with this idea saying, you know what, people should be able to have a tiny bit of money and own all of the stock market and not pay these huge mutual fund fees that are usually hidden, that are eating away at your ability to grow and compound what you have into real wealth. And he was one of the earliest people to ever come up with this idea of promoting the idea of an index fund. An index fund, again, is really simple. Instead of buying Apple or PepsiCo or Coke or whoever the case may be, you can actually buy this index which mimics the entire stock market. So you get a micro piece of all these companies, all the best companies, for example, in the S&P 500 or the Standard Poor's 500, if you're familiar with that. And so his idea has turned into a seven trillion dollar year business. And another person I got to spend quite a bit of time with that you learn about here in the book and here with me is a gentleman who started Vanguard, and that's Jack Bogle. He took this idea and he bet his fortune on it. Both of these men understood something. And the, when I sat down with Burton Malkiel, the first thing I said was, look, I know you're a straight shooter. <laughs> the guy definitely shoots from the hip. He doesn't care what people think. I said, tell me, what's the single biggest mistake that individuals make, that investors make, in their life. And he said, Tony, beyond a shot of it's a doubt is they don't take full advantage of the power of compounding. He said, Einstein said it was one of the single greatest inventions of humanity. Understanding it can change everything in your life. And everybody says they understand it, he told me, but very few people tap it. He said, understanding something intellectually is not the same as doing it. If you're doing it, then you know it. If you understand intellectually, you know, like I've said before, that and three dollars will almost buy a Starbucks buck of coffee. So what you really have to understand is how it works. And so I asked him, I said, Bert, what's the best way to teach it? And he went into this riff. And you know, in the, he's, he's in his late 70s. And it was kind of like, I, I've read him this him describe this before, but watching him do it there in front of my eyes, is his eyes sparkled and he got all in state. You can see he's done this so many times, but it's like a, a great musician, you know? It's like a Bruce Springsteen going off and doing a riff there directly for you. And his riff was to tell me the story about William and James. He said, don't let me give you a real example. Let's say two guys, William and James and let's say William starts out at 20 years old and he starts taking a little bit of his money and just locking it down and setting aside and investing it. Let's say he takes $300 a month, $4,000 a year and he puts that aside and he doesn't touch it and he puts it in the stock market and let's say over time he averages 10% and let's say he does it in an index fund so he's not being taxed continuously so it grows tax-free until the time he's going to take it out. And let's say he makes that investment, stay with me now, William makes that investment from the time he's 20, puts away that 300 bucks a month, that 4,000 a year, till the time he's 40, he never makes another investment again. That's it. And then we see what he has at age 65. And then on the other hand, he has a brother named James. And James, he doesn't get started when he's 20, he doesn't get started when he's 30, he waits till he's 40 and then he starts to say, God, I better start doing something. So he does the exact same thing his brother did. He starts putting away $300 a month, $4,000 a year roughly. 
he gets the same exact return, let's say of 10% in a tax protected environment. And at 65, from 40 to 65 is 25 years. So he spends 25 years putting money in the system. Think of it, four grand times 25 years is $100,000. His brother, William, he only did this for 20 years, 20 to 40, 20 years, times 4,000, 80,000. So the second brother, William and James, James put in significantly more money into the system, done it longer, but at age 65, they both got the same rate of return. Who do you think is doing better off? I know you know the answer, but the real question is, how much better off? And that's what most people have no clue of. William, who started earlier and quit earlier, has 600% more money. Not 20%, not 50%, not 600% more money. At age 65, both these men who got the same rates of return, but one started earlier and quit earlier, he has $2.5 million for William. And James, who started later and put more money into the system, but he started later, so he got less compounding, he ended up with $400,000. A $2.1 million difference. Now that could be the difference between total financial freedom for somebody, or doing okay for a while, and at 70 having to get a job to be a, you know, somebody greeting people at Walmart. See, this understanding of compounding is how you can free yourself from this idea that somehow you've got to make this giant score. Because the more you try to create that giant score, even if you get it, usually isn't kept. Now, how can I say that? Because I've been in this business working with people, some of the greatest entertainers, actors, musicians, sports stars, government officials who go off and make money afterwards. And I can tell you one thing, rarely do they keep it because they've never understood how to really tap into this power. And I'll give you one more example because Bert gave it to me at the time. He said, Ben Franklin, when he was you know, living alive, there were two cities that were kind of like sister cities for him. And it was Philadelphia and Boston. He went back and forth between them. They felt like hometowns to him. So when he died in 1790, he gave both cities $1,000, but the control and the guide was they couldn't be touched. The money had to be invested, had to be left alone for 100 years. After 100 years, he already calculated what he knew it would be worth. He said they could both take out a half a million dollars. That 1000 would be worth 500000 he had calculated, or more. It was actually worth a lot more. And then at 200 years, they have to leave the rest in and let it accumulate, and at 200 years, they could take all the money out for both cities. Well, both cities got a half a million dollar hit from a thousand dollar investment 100 years out. That's pretty amazing mathematics when it grows, you think about that. Nothing was added to it, it was just natural interest growing, the growth that happened in the market. And then what happened in 200 years? That $1,000 had grown to $6.5 million, even though they'd already taken half a million out and they didn't even get to compound for 100 years. 6.5 million, that's a 3,000% return. So compounding is amazing. And I know you've heard of it. I'm sure you've got examples you've heard. But what I really want to do in this particular session with you is get you to take step one to financial freedom. And that is to start tapping this power. And the way you're going to tap this power is give up the illusion that you're going to get this home run. And I'll help you with a home run. We'll use a metaphor. How about Kurt Schilling, Boston Red Sox. If you're a sports fan, you know about this man because he went to two World Series. Brilliant man. He made a hundred million dollars in income, 100 million. Now check this out. How much does he have today? He's bankrupt. In fact, he's not only bankrupt, he's upside down $50 million. How's that possible? Because when people make huge sums of money, no matter how much money we make, have you ever noticed that we seem to find a way to spend it? And you say, that's impossible. But when you make that much money, you buy yourself a business or you buy an island and guess what? <laughs> you can be upside down so quick and make your head spin. How about uh, if you're old enough, maybe you remember LA Confidential and the woman who won the Academy Award for that, Kim Basinger. Or maybe if you've really been around a while, you remember nine and a half weeks. She was the highest paid actress of her day. She was getting $10 million a movie at a time when no one ever dreamed of those kinds of numbers. But guess what? Today, she went through bankruptcy. She bought a little town, paid $20 million in Texas for a town, <laughs> made some bad mistakes, and went bankrupt.
I can give you a list that'll make your head spin. I mean, some of the greatest people that found themselves, if not bankrupt, completely busted. People like Willie Nelson, Marvin Gaye, Francis Ford Coppola, who did Godfather, for God's sakes. These are people that made more money than most people ever dream of. Or how about Mike Tyson? Mike Tyson made a half a billion dollars in prize money. He actually earned a half a billion dollars and then went bankrupt. In fact, he was upside down $27 million. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson reportedly had a contract for almost a billion dollars and he couldn't make the payments on his ranch, the Neverland's ranch, of $25 million. And after he's passed away, people made a fortune, like a lot of artists. But at the time of his death, things are pretty, pretty rough. So it doesn't matter how much money you have. In fact, most people describe what happens with, let's say, a fighter, uh, even somebody as, as brilliant as Money Mayweather. Brilliant guy. Unbelievable fighter. But you know, if you talk to nobody less than 50 Cent, his former friend and partner, he said, let me tell you what he does. He go out and he fights, he gets the money, he spends the money, and then he fights. He said, and you know, he carries around a Louis Vuitton bag full of literally a million dollars in cash, just in case anything special happens he wants to take advantage of. So, God forbid if something happens to this man and his ability to fight, he could be in real trouble. We can't do that. And it's easy to make fun of somebody else and go, well, look at what they're doing. But don't most Americans really like, instead of fight, say work, earn the money, spend the money, work? That cycle is the worst cycle on earth. And that's the cycle I want to get you out of right now today by tapping the power and making step one the most important investment decision in your life. So what the heck is it? Well... What if you decided that you were no longer going to be a financial trader? What are you talking about, Tony? I'm not a financial trader. I don't invest in stocks. I don't, I don't do that stuff all day long. Most Americans are financial traders, even though they don't think of themselves that way. Why? Because if you're trading time for money, you're making the worst financial trade in the world. Your goal, and the goal I have for you with this book, is to make money your slave. You want money to work for you, so you don't have to. Until that happens, you'll always have some level of uncertainty or fear or stress or insecurity because there's only so many things that can happen that mess up your income flow and you're in trouble. What would it feel like if you could build what I would call a money machine? Something that made money while you slept. Something that literally every day of your life, even if you weren't working, could provide you an income without ever having to work again. Because see, I ask people all the time, what are you investing for? And, and people say, well, uh, I don't know, I'm doing my 401k so someday I can retire. Or I'm investing so that I can get, you know, more assets or a bigger nest egg. No, you're not. You're investing for one thing and one thing only. You're investing because you want an income. You want an income that will last longer than you live. In fact, I mentioned before, the number one fear of baby boomers today is that not they're going to die. That's their number two fear. The number one fear is I want to run out of money while I'm alive. And millennials have the same fear because according to statistics, about 70 to 75% of the people are going to run out of money before they die. And we're all living longer. So the chance of that happening is off the charts unless you and I create a money machine. What does that mean? It's really simple. The most important financial decision of your life is deciding that a portion of all the money you earn in your life is yours to keep, that you're not going to give it up. It's for you and for your family, and you're going to keep a portion of what you earn forever, and you're going to grow it. That you're not going to give it to, you know, Kate Spade. You're not going to give it to The Gap. You're not going to give it to whoever you normally gave it to. You're going to keep that for yourself, and you're going to grow it into something that literally will make it so you don't have to work as long as you live. I call it a money machine because it's really simple. If you were to just think of yourself right now as you're a money machine, if you take a look at this graphic, here you are, you work your tail off, and what happens? You use your efforts to get money. You trade time for money. You take work and effort for money. But what if you just did something so simple? You already know to do it. You're just not probably doing it at the level that you could. What if you made a decision that a percentage of what you earn, you're never going to see it, it's just going to instantly and automatically be put into building this money machine where you're going to take a portion of what you earn, 10%, 15%, 8%, 20%. You get to decide the number, but a portion of what you earn, no matter what, before you ever see it, 
it's almost like a tax, but the tax is paid to you instead of the government. The tax is for your future self. The tax is about creating financial freedom. So you're not like most people who can end up their life being stressed out all the time, where you're the person who can do what you want, when you want, where you want, with whomever you want, because you got freedom. How do you get there? You take a portion of this money that you've done right now and you've earned, you automatically start to fill up this money machine. And just visually imagine, as you work, more goes in, you fill it up, 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 and there's a point, a trip, a, a, you know, a tipping point, if you will. Uh, we call the tipping point a critical mass. There's a point where the money you've saved and invested will have grown to a point that there's enough there that if you were to get just a small return on your money in a secure environment, the income off your investments, just the income, the investments are still there, the money is still there, that critical mass, that nest egg is so big that the interest you make on it alone, that interest gives you the income you need to live your life as long as you live while ever having to work again as long as you live, period. Now, I have that privilege and I'm fortunate I've helped a lot of people establish that who thought it would never happen because they don't understand that when you take that little piece aside, you're not just putting in this money machine. If you're smart, if you do what we show you in this book, the other six steps, that money won't just sit there accumulating. That money is going to grow. That money while you sleep is going to make more money and grow and grow and grow. So you get to that critical mass, that nest egg, that peak number where the income frees you for the rest of your life. Now, here's what's ironic. And I mentioned this before, but I want to reinforce it for you. If you do this, you will get to the point where you won't have to work. And then I will warn you in advance, you will work. <laughs> and the reason why is because the secret to financial freedom is not having to work. It's not not working. The idea that you don't have to work frees you up. Us as human beings, we have to do something to be productive or we go crazy. I can't tell you the number of people that I've met who've hit the jackpot and then they don't do anything and they're depressed or they're frustrated or they're bored out of their mind. You just want to make sure that what you do with your time is what you love, that it's your passion. And if your passion is your work, you'll work more. In fact, it used to be that the game, remember, was get rich and retire at 40. And now the game is get rich and retire at 80. <laughs> or 75 or 85. Like I've told you, my friend Steve Wynn, 72 years old, still going there. Warren Buffett, 84 years old. I mean, you can go to person after person after person. The people who make the most money, people make more than $750,000 a year. The vast majority say they'll never retire or if they retire, it'll be in their late 70s. That's because the game is different. But I'm gonna tell you something, when you don't have to work, you don't have to, you walk different, <laughs> you talk different, you feel different. You go, Tony, well, that sounds like a pipe dream to me. That's because you don't understand compounding. Because you're looking for that big score that hopefully someday you're going to get when really, truly, if you were William and not James, and you took a little bit of money and set it aside, and you just let that grow through time, you could have millions of dollars for yourself. And I'm going to show you how to make sure to maximize it. I'm going to show you how to make it more tax efficient so you keep more of that money. I'm going to show you how to diversify it so you protect it. I'm going to show you what I've learned from the best people on earth, but none of it is any good if you don't decide on a specific number that you're going to automate to make this happen. Now, I know when I say this, a lot of people say, well, how much? Well, the minimum should be 10%. And ideally, in the world we live in today, if you're 40 or above 45, you should be looking close to 15% because you have less time to use compounding. So you got to load the system with a bit more. And first thing you'd say, I'm sure many people say, are you kidding me? I don't have that kind of money. I'm spending everything I have right now to keep my, my credit card bills going, to keep myself going. Everything I earn, I spend. That'll always be true. It doesn't matter how much money people make. Trust me, I've been there myself. You know, I went from barely surviving, trying to figure out what to do, to earning extremely well, and then barely surviving because I overspent. And I mean, it's just the nature of human beings. Our vision gets bigger, we have more resources. But if you will draw a line in the sand and you, and you don't have to think about it. And the thing that Bert Malkiel told me, he said, Tony, the secret to it all is you gotta pick that, pick that number and then you don't change it. It's like a tax and you don't see the money. You, you, we'll show you how in the book here. You automate it so that money is taken out immediately. 
if somebody, if, if you run your own business or you go to work somewhere and they raise our taxes by 5%, 8%, 10%, you're going to hate it. You're going to be mad as hell and it's still going to get paid. That's just the way we are as human beings. So why not create a freedom tax? And it's really not a tax at all. What about a freedom gift? I call it the freedom fund. What you want to do is decide right now, right now, what percentage, and by the way, I'm going to mention one thing. You might say, well, Tony, I'm already doing this. I'm already contributing my 401k. Then I want you to decide right now, and I'm going to show you how to maximize your 401k. I'm going to show you how to get rid of the fees in your 401k. They're eating up your compounding. You're compounding fees if you don't know what you're doing in this area. But if you're already doing this, I want you to pick a number right now that you might increase to. And, and, and before you pick the number, whether it's 10 or 15 or 20, whatever that number is, you're going to want to decide it and not change it other than increase it maybe in the future and you're going to make it automated so that money goes into your freedom fund not a savings account a place where you're going to be investing that money and growing it till it hits a critical mass that throws off the income you need so you never have to work again so you have that true financial freedom so if you're saying, well, Tony, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Let me give you two pieces to help you think about this. I could name dozens of stories or examples of people that I've met over the years who started with nothing and became wealthy because they just took a little piece off and forgot about it and let it grow and grow and grow and grow. But I'll give you one of my favorite examples, Theodore Johnson. This is a man who never made more than $14,000 a year in his entire lifetime. He worked for UPS. And he only did one thing different than most people. At late stage of life, in his late 80s, he's worth $70 million. He did not inherit any money. All the money came from compounding $14,000 a year. How did he do that? He committed to one thing. He decided 20% of all he earned was going to be set aside. Every check, every bonus, every situation, 20%. There was no excuses. He'd have to find a way to do things differently, earn money other places. But that 20% was sacred. And it compounded over a lifetime for him and gave him $70 million. In his late 80s, he donated $35 million away, still had $35 million and guess what? Never made more than 14 grand. I mean, there's no excuse. When you understand the power of compounding, it's game over. But you gotta, you gotta get beyond your knowing what it is to acting. And that's really what I'd like you to do right now. So right now, why not make a decision right now in this moment and say, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stop trading time for money. I'm gonna make money work for me. I'm gonna make money my slave. And I'm gonna make a decision right now that no matter how hard it may seem in this moment, I'll get used to it. I've gotta decide a number that I'm gonna set aside and that number's not gonna move and I'm gonna automate it. What is that number for you? Is it 10%? Is it 15? Is it 18, 20? Is it, gosh, I gotta at least start with seven? What's the number gonna be? Make a decision right now. And if you already have a portion that you're putting aside, it's only going to get you so far. Make a number larger now. That'll be the decision, the most important financial decision in your life because investing can only be done with the capital you set aside. And if you wait to have a bunch of money to invest, you'll lose all the years that that little bit of money could have been compounding and going crazy. Compounding is the ultimate power. Tap that power right now by making your decision. Have you made it? Write it down. You know, when you think of something ahead, it goes out. Write it down. Drop it right now into your planner. Send yourself an email with that in the headline. What are you going to do right now so you lock it in your head? And so you lock it in your life. And then the question is, how do you go about automating that? Just open the book, to ch chapter 1.3. It'll walk you through how to do it. You can go to Schwab. You can go to TD Ameritrade. There are a variety of people that can automate it so it takes right out of your check into holding place. You say, well, then where will I take that money? Where will I invest that money? Those are the steps to come. First step is get in the game. And the only way you're going to be able to get in that game is start to tap the power by automating. Now, if you're sitting here right now saying, Tony, all this is well and and I've heard this before, I know compounding, then, you know, ah, but I just don't have any money to invest. What am I going to do? Then I'd like you to tap into the power of behavioral economics. I, I, one of the things I did when I wrote this book is I said, okay, people are going to know. Some things we're going to talk about, like what we're talking about right now is frankly common sense. 
But common sense is not too common. Have you noticed that? People know it, but they aren't doing it. So I said, I want to get people to do it. So I went and met with a whole series of Nobel Prize winners of behavioral economics. And the behavioral economists are guys that spend their entire life, and women, focusing on what is it in human nature that makes us screw up financially? And what technique can we use to get beyond our minds so that we don't need discipline and we automatically get the right results? What these behavioral economics experts do is they basically study the human brain and human nature and they try to figure out what is it in our nature, the way the human brain works, that makes us make the wrong decisions when it comes to finances. And one of those things has to do with the fact that, you know, we want these things, we give more value to things that are immediate than in the future. Like what is in front of you right now seems more real than 10 years from now, even though 10 years from now you're going to get there and if you don't do something now, it's going to be painful. And so a lot of these experts have figured a way to get around your own nature with these little behavioral tricks. So it doesn't take discipline to make it happen. So for example, Shlomo Benartzi, who's from UCLA, and Richard Thaler from Chicago both came up with a brilliant system called Save More for Tomorrow. Let me explain how it works. So if you right now say, Tony, I can't, I know I've got to save. I know I've got to get, you know, I've got to start tapping the power of compounding, but I'm spending every dime I have and there's no way out. First, bullshit. I'm sorry, but I just got to say bullshit. You can find a way if it's your entire life and future depends upon it. Don't accept that. We all get what we tolerate. There's a way to find it. There's something to cut. There's something to create. There's some way to add more value. We'll get to that later. But with this system, what they said is, look, if I said to you, next week we're going to meet and we're going to have this meeting, would you like to have some fresh fruit or would you like to have chocolate cake? When they do this research with students, about 80% of the people say, no, I'll have some fresh fruit, especially in an environment that is somewhat health oriented and so forth. But when they get to the meeting a week later, exactly the opposite, 80% reach for the chocolate, <laughs> the chocolate cake. So it's always easy to diet in the future. And similarly, when I say you got to take some money today and invest it, your brain says, oh, I don't have any room for that. There's no time for that. So what Shlomo and his partner Thaler did is they said, what if we let people save more tomorrow? What if you said to people today, make a commitment today that when you receive your next raise of any sort, that that raise will then be put aside for savings to in your freedom fund and to building your financial future. And interestingly enough, most people are saying, I'm willing to do that. I can't do it right now, but I'll do it in the future. And as a result, if you do this program, and I explain it in the book in more detail, but just the highlight note is you can go to your HR department and you can let them know. For every raise you get, you're going to take out X percentage. I'll give you an example. They took a group of people in the Midwest who were blue collar workers with no room to be able to save. These are people that said there's no way. So both uh, Shlomo and Thaler together said, you got to save three and a half percent. Anybody can save 3.5 cents out of a dollar. You've got to do that. So they all agreed. They said, but then you're also going to be used to this formula of save more for tomorrow, which means every time you get another raise, another 3% or 3.5% is going to be set aside. The most crazy thing happened. This group of people went from saving nothing or 3.5% to saving 14% on average. Now, when you start saving 14%, it's a different universe. You're going to start compounding. Get this, 65% of these blue collar workers who never saved anything in their life were saving 19%. Now, when you start saving almost 20%, that's what made this man with 14,000 a year end up with 70 million. That's the power of compounding activated. So here's what I'm going to say to you. There is a way. And if you say, Tony, well, but there, there isn't. Okay, I'll agree to do this in the future, but what if I don't get a raise? Well, if you don't get a raise, I'd say to you, learn to become more effective. I always tell people, find a job where your raise becomes effective when you do. Either own your own business, get yourself in sales, do something where you have some control or start a little business on the side. We can talk about those things later, but for right now, let's pretend you can't get any more money anywhere. How could you still do it? You can save and get that money to invest. Save something you're spending money on. How about this? Take one night a week and don't go out to dinner. 
order a pizza in, watch a movie at home instead of going out to the movies. You'll save at least $40. In the world we live in today, probably a bit more than that. If you save 40 bucks a week by just having a pizza, not going out for dinner on one of those nights, or going, not going out and spending that money, 40 bucks a week sounds like so small amount. But if you took that money and you put it in your freedom fund, and you grew it at 8%, and we're going to show you some people, for example, in this book, who've averaged over 75 years closer to 10% and with very little risk up and down. But let's say you averaged 8% and you left, that, you left it in there for 40 years. You know, you're 20 years old, you're 25 years old, you're 30 years old even. Plenty of time. Do you know what that money turns into? 40 bucks a week? That's almost 2000 a month. 80% compound, it turns into half a million dollars by itself. See, the money's going to get spent. The only question is, are you going to compound it in something real or are you just going to throw it away? The real goal in step one here, tap the power. If you want to say, what's the first step of these seven steps that are going to get you financially free? You tap the power by stop being a consumer and start to become an owner. That's what you are when you decide to invest. You become an owner in American business or world business. And when you own businesses that are growing, you get to grow with them. And as they compound in their value, you get to compound what you have and your ownership of them as well. So you've got to become an owner and you've got to become an investor. And the only way you can do that is decide on percentage you're going to set aside. Now, you can use save more for tomorrow, start with a small amount and build up. That's such an easy way to do it. You can just say, boom, I'm going to start with 15 right now. But you've got to make sure that it's automated. And if you're still saying, okay, all this is wonderful, but where do I come up with this money? Well, let's take something. You've all heard of people talk about their Starbucks strategy, stop drinking Starbucks. I think a lot of you are going to still drink your Starbucks. It's pretty addicted. But I'll give you a simple one. How about bottled water? You know, uh, I come from Fiji. I have a home in Fiji. And Fiji water is very popular around the world. I don't know what bottled water you drink, but almost everywhere you go, nobody drinks out of a tap. And I think for damn good reason. But there's an alternative to the tap. It's called filters. Filters cost almost nothing and they don't waste all the plastic. Do you know the average person, if they just if they took two drinks of bottled water a day, it's the same as your pizza, right? Two drinks a day, just think of it, over 30 days, check it out, 60, right? Times two bucks each. And you start going, huh, I got myself $120 a month. You know, if it's three bottles of water a day, that's $180 a month. $108 a month is going to get you past that, get you in that $2,000 range again. How about you just drink filtered water, get a filter at home. How about you get yourself, we have in our home here, these plastic bottles that you keep reusing that they don't leach plastic also, so you're not polluting your body. And by the way, did you know a plastic bottle, sorry to get all eco on you right now, but did you know one plastic bottle takes on average 450 years to break down? I'm living here on the ocean and almost every day there's some plastic that'll get rolling in here and some of it's been out there for 50 years and it's still coming back ashore. It's insane. We're living in a way that makes sense. We're using all this fuel to bring the water from someone else when you could filter it right here. How about you save yourself that money and put another half a million dollars in your pocket through time? Just another way of thinking about it. In fact, if you're trying to figure out how the heck do I ever get the money to invest in the first place? I'd say there's a couple places you could look and I'll wrap this video up. One, you could certainly find some things that you're currently spending money on that no longer give you joy. Uh, a friend of mine I wrote about in the books, the lady here was, she finally figured, figured out she was spending so much money on her car. It was an old car and the fixing in the car and the fuel in the car with financing, she'd go buy a brand new car. She went and bought a brand new Cherokee white pearlescence Jeep. She had this giant smile on her face. She'd only been through like five chapters of the book. But she figured out, you know what? For the money I'm spending, I could have a much better quality of life. And she was saving money also that she now put in her freedom fund to invest. In other words, money she was spending on the car, she got a better car. And the savings were now creating for a financial future where she wasn't the money machine anymore. Her freedom fund was going to become the money machine. You follow me? So there might be some things you could cut. There might be some things like water or bottled water that's, you're not losing anything. In fact, you get something better for yourself and less wasteful. So that's one approach. Another way is to find a way to earn more. 
and I'll show you in the book, we'll go through a section where I give you five little mini chapters. How do you save more? And I show you all kinds of examples so you have this money. I show you how you can earn more so you can speed up the process. And you say, but Tony, I can't earn more. I'm, I'm, I'm a school teacher. Well, I have the same mentality. My mom, when I was growing up, she wanted me to be a truck driver. She used to watch those truck master truck driving schools and they talked about you can make $24,000 a year if you become a truck driver. And my mom said, you've got to do this. You'll be on the open road. You'll have the sense of freedom. Your father's locked down. My father worked as a parking attendant underground in a, in a you know, a Century City garage in LA for 30 something years of his life, my natural father. And she said, you know, you'll make twice as much as your father and you'll have more freedom. But I looked around and I thought to myself, I, I think truck driving is a beautiful thing, but I had a mission of things I wanted to do. And I also thought, I don't think I could ever drive that truck far enough for long enough to be able to have freedom for my family for the future, because I didn't understand compounding. I could show a truck driver today how to do it, but I didn't know how. But I did learn something really important along the way. I was 17 years old, and I went to meet this man, I went, didn't go meet him, I went to attend a seminar by a man named Jim Rohn, who later became one of my first mentors. And Jim was a personal development speaker, and he would get up and talk for three hours, which I thought was a long time. If you've been to one of my seminars, you know that's not a long time. And he would share these tools and philosophies of how to improve your life, and a few strategies. And I was very touched by him, and the very first night I met him, he said some things I never forgot. He said, you know what? Everybody wants life to change, but for your life to change, you have to change. For things to get better for you, you've got to get better. And he said, instead of complaining about how you don't have the money and how you know things aren't fair or going on a strike, he said, rarely will that get you. Strikes will get you pennies of improvement. He said, the most powerful thing you can do in the marketplace is to understand how the marketplace works. And here's how it works. If you can find a way to do more for others, if you can find a way to add more value and become more valuable, you will become worth more. But you gotta be worth more. You've gotta be able to say, how can I do more for this business I work on? How can I help them save the money? How can I bring skill sets that make them more profitable? You gotta think about that because we're all paid in accordance to what our worth is in the marketplace. Not our spiritual worth, not our emotional worth, not what our worth is as a soul, but our economic worth. See, you know, in the world we live in today, there are people that make $7 an hour and there are people that make three and a half billion dollars a year. I'm not saying one is better or worse, but I'm saying one has a lot more choices. Now, why? Because if you go to work at McDonald's and you're working fast food, you're gonna make about $7.75 an hour currently. I just looked it up, crazy. It depends on where you live in the country, but $7.75. Now, at $7.75, you don't have enough to really support your family in any way. You're gonna have enormous stress. And we could say, well, we should make that number larger. But in reality, the reason you make 775 if you work at McDonald's is because almost anyone can be trained to do that job, especially the way it's automated today, in about an hour, maybe two. But if you're gonna earn more, you've gotta be able to give more, do more, create more. And I don't mean just work harder, you gotta do something that adds more value. Uh, David Tepper made the most money of anyone last year in personal income. He made $3.5 billion with a B. And that's because he's a hedge fund guy and we live in a world where the majority of people are putting their money in a bank where they're getting virtually no money or maybe 25, you know, a quarter of 1%, maybe 1%. And this man got the people invested with him a 40% return. Now, when you get 40%, that changes your life. Some people, if you're getting a quarter of a percent, if you're getting 1%, it's gonna take you a couple decades to double your money. At 40%, you're gonna double your money in you know, very short order, less than two and a half years. So, it's an interesting process to see what that value is. And he said, Tony, what you must do is find a way to do more for others than anybody else has done. He said, if you can find a way to help millions of people, then obviously you can be a millionaire if you want to be that. He said, but it's got to be something they want, something they value, something they think is incredible. Now, why do I tell you that? Because the first time I started talking about compounding and saying one way to do it is start to earn more and put more aside. If you think you don't have enough now, I, I had this school teacher come to me and she said, you know, but I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm this fixed income. And there's no way for me to get a raise. 
And I said, you know what? One of the great injustices of our current society is that the most important jobs, like, for example, a teacher, where we're entrusting the future to someone help us with our kids create their own future, create their skill sets, their abilities, they're horribly paid in this country. But you can complain about the system or you can take control of what's within your own control and you can find a way to add more value. She goes, how am I going to do that? I said, I know a school teacher, I described him in the book, who makes $4 million a year. How? He decided, I love working with 30 kids, but if I only work with 30 kids, I'm going to make $60,000 a year. But if I can find a way to work with hundreds of thousands of kids, I could earn hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of dollars. And all he did was he became incredible as a teacher. He's a Korean man and he just kept better and better. He's always finding a better way to teach, always find a more enjoyable way to teach, always finding a way to help people remember and learn quicker. He was just a learning machine and that added value. Every other teacher taught the same stuff. He brought students unique things and they wanted it. So he created a website where he could mentor them and we automated the mentoring. He now makes $4 million a year. So I'm just saying this to you, not to say you have to make $4 million a year, but my bet is, with some creativity, you could come up with something that could bring you an extra $300 a month. And $300 a month, invested over time, could easily bring you a million dollars, just based on the math and types of returns I described to you earlier. It's not a bad thing. If you found a way to do something bigger, all the more power to you. Uh, I got a chance, I was on the Today Show one day, and they called me up and they said, uh, we got Warren Buffett, and we want to have you on, and we're going to have the woman who is the youngest female billionaire in the world. And she has this company called Spanx. I said, like, what is Spanx? And if you're a woman watching, I'm sure you're smiling, laughing. He doesn't know what Spanx is. Most men don't know what Spanx are, but it, I guess it's kind of an undergarment that women use to help them effectively shape their body under a dress. This woman, she had no idea how to become a billionaire. It wasn't even her goal to be a billionaire. She just wanted to solve a problem that a lot of women have. And she was on her way to a party and she cut some pantyhose up and created this little device. And then she thought it was a great idea and everybody said it was stupid. And she tried and tried and tried and heard no, no, no. And she just wouldn't give up. And then finally she got someone to make some and then she sold some and then she eventually got an Oprah. And now Spanx is a multi-billion dollar business and she's the youngest female billionaire in history. So I want you to know there's a range from school teachers to this one was working at Disneyland. Um, there are people that might want to make $100, $500, $1,000 more a month. And if you find creative ways to earn more by giving more, by creating more, the answers are there. I just want to get you going. I've got a whole chapter on this, but what I don't want to leave this section with you doing is thinking, I can't do this. And I'll just give you one last one. Another way you get the money to grow your financial future is keep more of the money you have. So I've got a whole chapter here in the book on really it's the secrets of the ultra wealthy that you can use too. And you'll find it in section five of the book. And uh, in fact, it's chapter 5.5. .5. You want to look it up when you go there. And what it is, is if you're trying to get financially free, you have to remember what is the most expensive cost that you have in your life. I mean, what is the deepest thing you're going to spend money on in your life? And for the vast majority of humans in this country, at least, and North America and most Western nations, it's taxes. And so taxes, you got to understand in this country, the IRS, their job is really simple. They're, they're not mean people. I mean, they're mean people in every industry, so I'm sure there's some. They're like Switzerland. Their job is to get as much money as they can from as many people as they can every year. And your job, according to the Supreme Court, is to use all of your ethical capacity, everything that's ethical, everything that's legal, to pay the least that you can. And you have that right. That's not being not democratic. Now, I pay I paid plenty of taxes, tens of millions of dollars in taxes, and I'm really grateful that I have the ability to do that at this stage of my life. But I also have learned from all the best investors that I've worked with, I'm talking the best on earth, they all know that tax efficiency is one of the ways to speed up how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Because if you can keep more of what you have and compound it, you're going to do even better. And there's a tool that ultra wealthy people know and use. It's IRS sanctioned. The IRS supports it. And very wealthy people and very wealthy organizations use it. And it allows you to grow your investments literally in an environment where it can be not just tax deferred, but tax free. What that means is if you tell me you have 
half a million dollars built up over the years in your 401k. I might say to you, if you're in the 50% tax bracket, no, you have $250,000. You might say, Tony, no, that's not true. I've, I've got half a million. I said, yeah, but half that's the government's money if you make 50%, if you have a 50% tax. But what if that half a million could be put in an environment where when you made a half a million, it was all yours? That would get you your goals twice as fast, wouldn't it? Or if you're at a 30% tax rate, 30% faster. It might save you a decade. So be sure to check that part of the book out. All I want to get you to know is the game is you got to tap the power. Step number one. Step number one of being repetitive, but I want you to get it. We want to make that decision right now. Step number one is make the most important financial decision of your life. Decide right now. What percentage are you going to keep for your family forever? What percentage of your money are you going to set aside, automate, and make sure you put in a freedom fund that you're going to start to invest and build into something that will eventually provide that income for you where you never have to work again as long as you live. You only work because you want to, not because you have to. Sound exciting? Well, as simplistic as it is, I'm sure part of your brain's going, well, okay, I'll do that, but where am I going to invest? Where am I going to put this money? That's coming next. But first, you got to make the first step. So. We turn this video off, either pick up the book, read the details, or call Fidelity or Swab or go online and find a way you're going to just automate deducting. What's the number? Don't change it. If you already got a number, increase it. Is it 10? Is it 12? Is it 14? Is it 15? Is it 20? Is it at least 7 or 8? And then what are you going to do to grow it through time? All right? I hope I got your attention. The power of compounding will give you real wealth not just going for a big hit. And hey, by the way, if you get a big hit and you're smart, you'll throw a bunch of it into your freedom fund. You'll just get there faster. Thanks for watching. Look for my next video in a couple of days. Live strong and live with passion. Hey, it's Tony Robbins. Welcome back. Listen, you're back to Money Master the Game, seven simple steps to financial freedom. In our third session here, I'd like to now talk to you about step number two. Remember, step number one was tap the power. Make the most important financial decision of your life, which is to stop trading time for money, to become an owner, not just to somebody who is you know, buying things, but somebody who has become an investor. And the way you have to do that is by deciding a percentage you're going to save, and you're going to keep that and put it into a financial freedom fund. You're going to take that money before you see it, put it aside, and you're going to invest it. I know the question you want to ask yourself is, okay, Tony, where do I put it? Before I tell you some places of what the best on earth say where to put it and how to divide that up, we first got to go to the second step. And that second step is become an insider. So you have to know the rules before you get in the game. I mean, think about it. We've all heard the story, it's been said a million times, it's almost trite, that when a person with experience meets a person with money, the person with experience ends up with the money and the person with money ends up with the experience. And that happens every single day in the financial world. The financial world is designed primarily not to meet the needs of an individual investor, but to meet the needs of the organizations that have built them. That's why we have this high frequency trading where somebody knows what you're going to buy in advance, in milliseconds, buys and sells and makes money off of you, because the system is not about protecting you, as by now I'm sure you're, you're, we're well aware of. However, even though some people will call that system rigged, there's a way you can still win, but you've got to know the rules or you're going to get hurt. This is an area where most people started to do okay financially, and then something happened and they got burned, and then they give up, and you just can't give up. So I'm here to make sure you don't get burned. If you were burned in the past, put that behind you. It's not going to happen again. And in my book here, I'm covering nine of the biggest financial lies. They're basically marketed myths that people buy into that allows other people to take control of your finances and make much more from your money than they ever should in a million years. So let's start out. Let me just start out by saying, let's you and I become the insider by starting to understand how this system works. And let's do it by just asking a simple question. What if I said to you right now, what if I said, I want you to imagine just for a moment, someone comes to you with the following investment opportunity. The person says they want you to put up 100% of the capital, they want you to take 100% of the risk, and if it makes money, they want 60% or more of your upside over the life of your investments over decades. They want that to come to them, even though they put up no money, and they took no risks. 
Are you, are you going to make a deal where you put up all the money, take all the risk, they take no risk, put up no money, they get 60% over time of your money? You'd say, I wouldn't, you don't have to think about that one. Doing that one's never going to happen in a million years. Really? Let me give you a clue. If you own most mutual funds, that's the deal you've already got. They say, how is that humanly possible? Because people don't know what they're paying in fees and they don't understand the power of compounding. Now, if you watched the last video that we just did together, you saw that little amounts of money can compound in a huge amounts of money in a very short period of time. And the same thing happens with investing. Most of us start investing and it, we don't invest tomorrow and get the return. We invest over decades. And investing over decades, these hidden fees build up and they eat away. The person I went to to get the answer for this was Jack Bogle. Jack Bogle is in his mid 80s and Jack's been in the investment business now for 64 years. And here's what he said to me. He said, Tony, it's simple. Most people just don't do the math. The fees are hidden. He says, try this. If you made a one-time investment, just one time of $10,000 at the age of 20, someone gave you the money, you put it aside, 20 years old, and you just grew it at 7% per year over time, you'd have $574,464 by the time you got to my age, he said, which was 80. But if you just paid only 2.5% in management fees, and as you're gonna learn in a few minutes, most management fees are more than 2.5%. I know they tell you it's 1%, but in this video, you're gonna get an education so you don't get robbed in the future. But if you just pay 2.5% in management fees or other expenses, your ending account balance would have been only 140,274 over the exact same time period. I said to him, Jack, how is that possible? I mean, how could, how, how could people be seduced like this? How could we be giving away that much? He goes, Tony, people don't do the math. The fees are hidden and the compounding happens over time. He said, it's insane. And that's why he built Vanguard. Because in Vanguard, there aren't all these hidden fees. If you were to invest in Vanguard and you say, I want to invest in the stock market instead of a mutual fund, you can own Vanguard's group of the market, this large number of companies, all the best companies, and you might be paying 0.14%. That's not even, say, see, 0.24 is called 24 basis points. That's a quarter of a percent, 0.25. 0.14% you get the idea it's not even a percent it's this tiny little number so as you're investing the compounding is all coming to you not going to fees now vanguard's not the only company like this but vanguard is set up as a non-profit organization that's one reason why so many great investors make investments in vanguard now i don't have any investment in vanguard personally i don't make any money on vanguard it's non-profit i'm just telling you because it's one place to go dfa funds is another and as we go through the book you're going to learn where the best ways is to protect yourself but let's just start for a moment and say let's you and i say we want to win this game we want to master the game of money to master the game, we got to tap the power of compounding. But number two, we've got to become insiders that won't get taken advantage of. We've got to know the rules of the game before we get in or we're going to get hurt. Because in this place called finance, what you don't know will hurt you. So I want to make sure you know. Let's talk about for a second, though, about what is the path to financial freedom? What does it really look like? I like to think of it as a mountain. And if you want to visualize a mountain, maybe we'll throw something on the screen for you at this point. Just imagine that there's two primary steps in investing. The first step is early in your life, you spend most of your life accumulating money. You're working your tail off. If you're smart, you're taking a piece of that, keeping it for your family, putting your, your, your financial freedom fund, you're letting it grow. And as time goes by, you're climbing the mountain of financial success. Now there's a point when you hit the peak. The peak is that when that money machine of yours has enough money in it that you've hit what we call the critical mass. A peak level where from now on, if you would invest that money in a relatively secure environment, the income from your investments would provide enough income for you to never have to work again. So step one is you climb the mountain. And climbing the mountain, there's a lot of things that knock you off the mountain, like bad fees, like bad advice, like bad investments that can throw you down, back down the mountain, starting over. But if we can help you, and that's what I'm going to do here in this book, I'm going to guide you up the mountain. But once you get to the mountain, nobody talks about this. Most of the financial planners don't, and certainly brokers don't. You have to decide at some point, I'm going to take the money I have, 
and I'm going to start taking it out and I'm going to start to spend it. I'm going to start to ski down the mountain at some point and just take in life, take in my family, enjoy what I'm doing in my life. And hopefully that'll last for you two or three decades because today, if people retire at 65, the average person lives to be 85 if they're 65 years old. That's 20 years of retirement. And that's the average. Many people live 30 years. So that's a long time to get skiing and enjoying. But to do that, you got to also, as part of this book, say, when do I start taking the money out? And how do I make sure that money's going to really be there? Because if I climb the mountain and then the stock market drops 50%, then I, I'm no longer at the peak of the mountain. I'm, I'm going to start over. I might be 65 years old, like what happened to people in 2008. Now, let me give you an idea of how we're going to help you get up that mountain. The first thing we're going to do is start looking at what those myths are that if you don't understand them, they can take you down very quickly, like, like missing the rocks and dropping quite a ways. And one of the first myths that people tell you all the time is, give us your money. We'll beat the market. Well, let me give you an idea of where do most people in America put their money? They put it in a 401k, right? Or some form of retirement account. There aren't many pensions that are left unless you work for the government. Few very large organizations, but very few. And so your goal is to have a pension eventually. Your goal is to have an income for the rest of your life where you can ski down the mountain and have a great time with your friends and your family and do what you want to do. So how are we going to build up to that? Well, most people don't know where to put their money. Most people work their tail off at their job. They come home. They want to be a great lover and friend and parent, and they want to make a difference to their community and take care of their family. And they're, I mean, we got so many things, and we got to be an investment expert on the side. And because we're not investment experts, the people that are the experts, they know how to rig and wire the system to chip away at what we have and compound it over time to get the majority of the profitability if we let them. In fact, David Swenson gave me a great quote. Uh, David Swenson is the gentleman who's the chief investment officer for Yale, and he took their endowment fund, which has taken a century, I guess, to accumulate of a billion dollars, and he converted it into 24 billion, to be exact, 23.9 billion dollars today, and he did it in two decades. It's unheard of. He is the rock star of institutional investing. So if there's anybody I want to go to and say, where do investors put their money? Should they put it in mutual funds, which is where almost everybody does? In fact, he calls it the $13 trillion lie. And let me give you the exact quote of what he said to me. Quote, when you look at the results on an after fee, meaning after paying all the fees, and after tax basis over any reasonably long period of time, there's almost no chance that at the end you're going to beat an index fund with a mutual fund. Now, he wrote a book, by the way, called Unconventional Success, and this is a guy that is unmatched in the business. So most people are saying to you, and I talk about this in chapter 2.1, they're saying the first lie is we're going to beat the market. And most money managers are doing it through a mutual fund. But to give you an idea, here are the statistics. And this is a statistic you should know if you forget everything else on this video. This one will free you from hypnosis and from the marketing. Because by the way, ask Jack Bogle, how is it people are putting the money in mutual funds when they're putting the money up, they're putting all the risk, they're taking all the risk, the other people aren't, and they're getting all this money taken out of their pocket? And he said, Tony, it's marketing. He said, you can market anything. We marketed people to smoke cigarettes for decades. You can get people to do the dumbest thing. First time you smoked a cigarette, what was it like? You can go, mm, yumbo, you cough like crazy, but then your brain went, hey, the sex will be worth it. Because you saw this advertising and it convinced you. He said, that's all we've done with mutual funds. That's all we've done with these financial institutions. So here's the statistic you need to know. 96% of all mutual funds... Stay with me now. 96% of all mutual funds do not match the market, the general market, over any 10-year period of time. I want that you to sink in for a second. What does that mean? You have a choice. You can go to a mutual fund. Most mutual funds are going to tell you, if you ask the person, what are my fees? And they're going to say, well, the fees here is 1%. That 1% is usually what's called the expense ratio. But if you were to actually go through and stay with and go through the 30 or 40 or 50 page document and read all the legalese, you'll find out something very different. In fact, there's a gentleman who has a degree in economics. His name is Hilton Smith. 
And Mr. Hilton Smith decided that he wanted to understand why, why was the market going up, but his account wasn't going up. And having a degree in, a degree in economics, and he worked for Demos, which is a, a, a fund of, of kind of brain, a brain trust, if you will. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a project to dig in here and figure out what I'm really spending. And a couple things happened. Number one, Forbes did an article and did some of the work for him. They went in and found out that the average mutual fund in America today charges 3.19%. And you say, that's not possible. Mine's only 1%. But what happens is you go underneath and the expense ratio is 1%. But in that contract of yours, there's all these other terms, A, B sources. There's all, there's, Literally, if you look at my book, there are 17 different terms for things that you may not know are fees, but they take money out of your pocket just the same. And when you take out 3.1%, imagine you're making a 6% return and your mutual fund costs you 3%. You mean you net 3% and you don't even net it because now you got to pay taxes on it. And oh, by the way, if you have a mutual fund, most of the mutual fund managers are saying to you what? Buy and hold, buy and hold on to us. But the mutual fund manager doesn't buy and hold. The mutual fund manager actually goes out and very often is trading all those stocks, all those bonds, trading constantly. So when things are being traded constantly, there's a tax impact. When you buy something and you hang on to it, a piece of real estate, anything, a share of stock, and you hold on to it for more than a year, a little past a year, you develop a different tax rate. You get what's simply called capital gains. Today, capital gains tax is 20%, and then you pay whatever your state tax is, as, as opposed to ordinary income, which might be 50% for you or close to it when you add everything in. So big difference in what you get to keep. If you're in a mutual fund, they're trading constantly. You may keep the mutual fund for more than a year, but when you get your bill, you're gonna get an ordinary income tax rate. So if you're a person who makes, you know, and you're a 50% tax rate, you had 6% return, 3% came out with fees, and now the balance of 3%, you're gonna pay 50% in taxes, you're left with 1.50%. You make 1.5% for taking the risks of being in the stock market. It's crazy, totally crazy. But most people just don't know. They have no idea what really happens. So I want you to see two things here. First of all, I wanna show you that trying to pick the right mutual fund is next to impossible because 96% of them don't match the market. Well, you could own the market for, let's call it 20 basis points. You know what that means now? It means 0.20. It means less than a quarter of a percent. Or you could have owned the same stocks through a mutual fund and paid 300% more or more, 3,000% more at 3% then what would have actually cost to own the same product? If I said to you, you could own this car for $20,000 or someone else bought the car for three thirty thousand dollars $30,000, you know, $300 versus $30,000 or some ratio like that, you go, it's the same car. That's the same thing with these investments, but you're paying those kinds of fees. Are we making sense? I know I'm hammering this hard. So let's start, let's separate these two. First, are you ever going to really beat the market? That's the myth everybody has. I'm just here to tell you, it ain't gonna happen. Now, I'm not saying it. I've interviewed Warren Buffett. I've interviewed uh, Ray Dalio, one of the, the largest hedge fund in the world. I interviewed David Swenson. I've interviewed Jack Bogle. I've interviewed Nobel laureates. And they all, one after another after another, say nobody beats the market except a few unicorns. There's a tiny number of hedge fund guys like Ray Dalio who, like Paul Tudor Jones, who've been able to beat the market year after year for years. But unfortunately, I say nobody beats the market because you're not gonna have access to them. Ray Dalio stopped taking money a decade ago. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Paul Tudor will not take your money no matter what it has because these guys got so big that when they made an investment, it was so big, if they got in and out of the market, they couldn't get in and out, they weren't flexible. So the best people in the world are just not available anymore, and they're only available to the ultra witch anyway. So if you and I are gonna practically succeed, what's your chance of taking your 401k and picking the right mutual fund? Well, if 96% don't match the market, and only 4% do, I'm gonna find that 4%, really. Let me tell you what the chances of finding that 4% are. 
Ever played blackjack? If you go to Vegas or, you know, wherever you go, Atlantic City, someplace in the world, play blackjack, go online and do it. I'm sure you know how to play. It's called 21. You try to get to 21 without going over. If you have 22, you lose. If anybody gets higher than you above that number under 21, they win. So how does it work? Well, let's say one day you're playing blackjack and you get delivered by the dealer, you know, two face cards. They're worth 10 each, that's worth 20 points. If you go any higher, your chance of failing is really, really bad. If you're any inner idiot, there's only one card that can give you 21, that's an ace. There's only four in the whole deck. If your idiot idiot says, hit me, give me another card, you have an 8% chance of getting 21 in blackjack if you got two face cards and you get the one ace. You got an 8% chance of victory. Picking the right mutual fund, you got a 4% chance of victory. It's not gonna happen. In fact, if Warren Buffett, if you wanna know how Warren Buffett feels about it, in his famous 2014 letter that he sent to all his shareholders, he explained that as the world has changed and what he wants done with his money is also the same. That when he passes, he wants his wife's money that's in trust, 90% of it to be put in index funds. And he said, why? Because you're just not gonna beat the market. The markets are too efficient today. It's just not gonna happen. So when Warren Buffett says this, you get a little clue what has to be done. But every other one of these experts I talked about as well talked about it, that through time, somebody can win for a period of time, but over the years, the market itself is what really wins. In fact, Warren Buffett put his money where his mouth was. He built a million dollar wager against New York based protege partners. And what was the bet? He bet protege that if they couldn't pick, he'd give them up to five hedge fund managers, the best five in the world, and that the five hedge fund managers couldn't collectively beat what the S&P and 500 index did over a 10 year period. In other words, he's put his money in index where there's virtually no fees. They're gonna have these huge fees on hedge funds. Let's see who wins. Well, guess what? As of February of 2014, the S&P 500 is up 43.8% and those five hedge funds are only up 12.5%. They're light years behind and they got a lot more expense. So it's, it's kind of like, think about if you were like the world's fastest man, you know, Bolt's his name, you know, and now you're running against a pack of Boy Scouts. That's what happens when you own the index. That's how different it is. Now, Ray Dalio said point blank, you're not gonna beat the market, no one does. Only a few people are gold medalists and most people don't have access to those people. So. If you understand this, then you ought to understand that this is not just one research project. An industry expert named Robert Arnott, he's the founder of Research Affiliates, very well known, spent two decades studying the top 200 actively managed mutual funds. Now, what does actively managed mutual fund mean? And they're all over 100 million. When you go to a mutual fund, most of you are going to an active fund. You're saying, I'm gonna give my money to somebody and what they're gonna do is, they're gonna take my money and they're gonna figure out where to put it because they're gonna be smarter than me. But in reality, 96% of the time, you could have just taken what the market was overall, a piece of the top companies, 96% of the time, you'd be doing better. What did Arnott find out? The results were startling. From 1984 to 1998, a full 15 years, only eight out of 200 fund managers beat the Vanguard 500 index that's again, less than 4% odds, exactly the same as the other study that I gave you. In fact, here's one that'll really mess up your head. There was a study done over a 20 year period, starting December 31st, 1993, and it ended December 31st of 2013. And it was to find out what did the S&P 500 return on its average return versus what did the average mutual fund investor make? And it was done by a group called Dalbar, which is very famous. Here's what they found. Number one, if you own the index, if you just own the stock market, a piece of it all, you had an average compounded rate of return of 9.28%. But the average mutual fund investor made just 2.54%. And that's Dalbar research. I mean, Think about that, a nearly 80% difference between somebody who just owned the market versus somebody who got an index that cost them next to nothing. Now, some people say to him, Tony, no, no, I'm smarter than that. I go to Morningstar, I go look, and if you're not familiar with Morningstar, they're a rating service, and they rate all these funds. I go to Morningstar, and I only go out in there, and I get five-star funds, that's all I invest in. Well, 
Five star funds are so important that uh, a study that was done over a decade long found that 72% of people put their money in four and five star funds. Two trillion dollars goes into whatever Morningstar calls a four or five star fund. There's just one problem. Researchers went back all the way to 1999, did a 10-year study, and guess what they found out? Of those five-star funds, there were 248 mutual funds that were rated five stars. That was at the beginning of the period. At the end of the 10 years, only four of them were five stars. And David Swenson told me, he said, Tony, that star system is so important. I want to tell you how they manipulate it. He said, what mutual fund companies do is check this out. He said, wouldn't you love to invest like this? They open up five different types of funds. One's an international fund, one's a U.S. stock fund. They do all these different funds. And they see how they do. And the ones that don't do well, they eliminate. And the ones that do, they promote and market. And they say, we have this four-star, five-star fund that's getting you this great return. He said, wouldn't you love to tell your friends, make five different investments or 10, get rid of 90% of them, when you lose money, only count the one that made you money and promote to your friends, you're the next Warren Buffett. He said, that's what they do. He said, Tony, I gotta tell you that 96% you quoted, it's false because they don't count all the funds that they've either immersed, immersed with another one so it disappeared or just let go of. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling what's happened in this area. So as we roll along, I want you to understand that if you're gonna really make money and compound your money, you're going to want to own the market. And you're going to want to not be paying ridiculous fees. And I will tell you one more thing. When people talk about fees, a lot of people think, well, because I'm in my 401k, then I don't have to worry about fees. In fact, a lot of people think there are no fees in their 401k. Some research showed that one third of people think there are no fees in their 401k. Nothing could be further from the truth. Forbes article that showed the average mutual fund was 3.1%. They found the average fees that people are paying inside their 401k is worse than if they were been paying taxes, over 4%. Now, what's the impact of fees? Let me give you a little visual on this so you get a sense. Because otherwise, right now, you might be saying, Tony, you're babbling 1%, 3%, who cares? You should care. You understand compounding now, right? So let's do an example. Let's take three friends. And all three friends are equal. They're, they're 30 years old and they all start out with, let's say, $100,000 or so the 35 and I start with $100,000. And they're going to invest for 30 years from 35 years old to 65. They all invest in the exact same stocks. But one person does it in a mutual fund that charges 3%. One does it in a mutual fund that charges 2%. And one does it in a mutual fund that charges 1%. Well, let me figure out here just for a second, what's the impact of that? Well, the person who was only charged 1% in fees, their $100,000 over 30 years, growing at 7% compounded, 100,000 becomes $574,349. It becomes almost six times what they started with, and all it did was let that money grow. I didn't add money, it was just compounding. That's the power of compounding once again. Tap the power, baby. But if we roll a little further, you start to look down and what do you find out? You find out the person that was being charged 1%, excuse me, 3% in fees, they found themselves in a very, very different world. Those people, that person, instead of having almost $600,000 has literally $324,000, $340 left. They literally have 77% less money and what was different? They invested in the same stocks. They invested in the same pieces. The only difference were the fees. 77% went to fees. So one person's got almost a million dollars and the other person is probably trying to figure out how they're gonna survive because that won't last very long. In fact, Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard says, quote, I think high costs eroding away your returns are as much a risk for investors as the economic situation in Europe or China. So you don't want to get 
pulled into this. And I do recommend you read the article in the book. It's the Forbes article. It's called The Real Cost of Owning Mutual Funds. It was written by Ty Burnick, and he peels back the layers to dissect the actual costs and arrive at that heart-stopping total of the average mutual fund costing of 3.17%. And on 401k plans, what you're supposed to have is a low cost. He started finding out the, the expenses were even more. It's the average plan administrator. To, to do your 401k, they charge an administration fee. It's somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5% annually, according to the nonpartisan government accountability group. That's what they found. So that's $1,300 of every 100000 just to participate in the 401k. So when you have that 1.3% on top of the 3.17%, you can actually be paying more expensive to own a supposedly tax-free account or tax-deferred account. You might be paying... 4.47 to 4.67 percent. Now it's a bunch of numbers. What the hell does that mean? Once again, if you're getting a six percent return, and someone's taking away 4.47 percent, that means you're getting 1.5 percent, and then you have to pay taxes on the 1.5 percent. That's totally insane. Are you becoming an insider? See, I want you to get it. Next time someone says, I'm going to beat the market. They might. They might be beat the market for a year or two or three or four, but they're not going to do it over a decade or more. Nobody does. Nobody stays that way. There's a few unicorns. I'm going to introduce them to you in this book. I'm going to show you how they invest. You can do it directly if you want to, but it's not going to happen through a mutual fund. Again, I'm not here telling you anything that's my opinion. Everything in this book, as you go through the book, you'll see there's nothing that's my opinion except what to do emotionally. When it comes to investing, this is not the Tony Robbins show. This is the show of the Ray Dalios. This is the show of the Jack Bogles. This is the show of David Swenson. This is the show of Kyle Bass, who took 30 million and made it 2 billion in two years. This is the show of Paul Tudor Jones, who's made money every year for 28 consecutive years. This is the show of the best on earth. They're the first time they're opening the doors and they're showing you what's happening. So let me give you one more myth and then we'll get out of this section. Are you seeing, by the way, what a difference this can make? I mean, I give you a $100,000 example. Many of you out there, you're going to accumulate a million dollars. A million dollars growing at 7% with 3% fees versus a million dollars growing at 7% with 1% fees. It's the difference between $7 million versus $4 million. It's a $3 million difference. The numbers only get more intense if you don't take care of yourself. So in the book, I'm showing you how to do that. But what's the most viable way to take care of yourself? Because right now, my guess is, I'm talking 100 miles an hour. I'm passionate. That's why it's better to read the book. But some people want to watch a video, so I'm here for you. <laughs> but you're saying, like, Tony, you're running these numbers for me. Let me do, what do I take from this? Here's what you take. You're going to be taken unless you become an insider. What's the first rule? Nobody beats the market. How are you going to protect yourself? If you make investments of this sort, you're going to be looking more likely to own the market in an index. And the second piece they're going to tell you is fees don't matter. You're going to go BS. Fees are compounded and they matter. In fact, Mr. Hilton Smith, when he did his research, he found that somebody who only makes 30000 a year on average in their lifetime will lose $150,000 in fees. That's a small investment. That's someone who's, that's to give you an idea, if you're making 30000 a year, that's five years of retirement that they give up in fees. Now, most people watching a video like this, most people reading my books, are earning substantially more than 30000 a year. So if you're in the $100,000 range, it might be a half a million dollars or more in fees. Just think about that. This book, this little video, if you're hearing me right now, if you'll stay with me and just go, I am not going to be taking advantage. I'm an insider. No one's going to beat the market long term. So I'm going to go for indexes on those areas. I'm not going to let somebody hammer me on fees. I'm going to go for the lowest possible fees. And I'm not going to get deluded by somebody pumping me up with some story. I'll tell you a third lie you should be aware of. Average returns. Average returns. You know, you might have your broker say to you something like, hey, you know, you know, overall, you're doing good. Your average return is X. Let me give you an example. Let's say you buy a bunch of investments and your broker says to you, well, you know, overall, it's not bad. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say, imagine a stock market, and this is an imaginary, it goes up or a stock, you own Apple, and it goes up 50%, and then it drops 50%. 
And then it goes up 50%. And then it drops 50%. Just watch it. Up 50, down 50, up 50, down 50. Look, it looks like a straight line, doesn't it? On paper, it's a straight line. On paper, your average rate of return was zero. You didn't make money, but you didn't lose money. But if you put dollars to this, you'll see it's quite different. Because there's av- there's what we call average returns, and then there's actual returns. And I'll give you a clue. Actual returns are the only thing you can spend money on. You can't take average returns. So let's say you put $100,000 in, and it goes up 50% to 150000 Now that one hundred fifty dollars is going to drop 50% down to 75000 Now it goes up 50%. Oh, wow. 75000 went up 50%. Hmm, now I'm on 100 and what, 5,000. I'm off of my number, they'll put it on the screen. And then it drops 50% and look where you end up. You end up not even, you end up down 43.75%. Check it out. And you would have thought you were even. See, these are the types of tricks people use to manipulate your mind and get your money. So let me finish with one final lie that might be really helpful for you. Let's see what we've learned so far in this film. One, we've learned nobody beats the market. We've learned that we have to really be smart in this area because it's easy to be seduced. Somebody might beat it for a while, but not long term, not according to Warren Buffett, not according to the 50 best experts that I've interviewed. Second, fees do matter. So we want to reduce those fees as low as humanly possible. Third, average returns are not real returns. In fact, in mutual funds, The numbers they actually advertise, when you see that's the rate of return they've gotten, is not the return you're going to see. Because the vast majority of people, and by the way, Jack Bogle goes crazy about this in my interviews, the average person thinks, oh, if I put my money in that mutual fund, that's the return I would have gotten. But most people put their money in at different stages, like a certain amount each month to your 401k. Your actual rate of return is not the same as the whole year. They might have had a good month. If you weren't in that good month, or you only had a certain amount of money in that good month, you didn't make an 8% or 9% return, you made something far less. So there's a lot manipulating you. So where do you go? Where do you go to trust somebody? Well, here's the worst part. First, somebody tells you they're going to help you beat the market. They don't. Then they're going to tell you fees don't matter, and they're going to have you take the risk, you put up the money, and they're going to take a lot of money. Then thirdly, they might promote to you, you're doing okay on average, And then after all that, here's the fourth lie. They'll look in the eye and say, I have your best interests in mind. (laughs) And unfortunately, maybe the person representing you does. Meaning, the world we live in today is a bizarre world. The financial industry has has just huge influence because of the economics that they spend on Congress, on lobbying Congress. And the person who's representing you, in most cases, who's representing your money and your investments, is not legally required to make sure they put your interests ahead of their own. In fact, there's a legal distinction for it. And that legal distinction is this idea of whether or not you have to have what's called a suitable investment versus a fiduciary. Now, I know your brain's going to want to be fried for a moment, but if you stay with me on this, I can promise you I can save you a ton of money and get you the advice and find somebody you can trust. There are 302 names for a broker today. They're everything from wealth advisor to broker. They're every term you can imagine. What makes somebody a broker is they represent a big company, let's say a big bank, for example. And so they're really a salesperson. They can only sell you what you have. If you go to a Toyota dealership, they're not going to sell you a BMW. They can only sell you what they have. And they make the company, what they promote is what the company is designed to make money off of. So whatever fund they're going to sell you, they're designed to make money off it. And that's what they're selling. Now, this person selling to you might be sincere. They might care deeply about you. They may truly, they may even put their money in the same place you put yours. But they could be sincere and be sincerely wrong because they're part of a captured system. Let, let me give you an example. I watched a video. A friend of mine sent this to me. It was a YouTube video. And it's called The Butcher versus the Dietitian. And it's a simple video, but it's so smart. It's one of those cartoon videos where the guy speaks and they draw it. And what they did in this video is the man on the, in the video says, listen, let me explain to you the difference between what we would call a broker 
and what you would call uh, a registered investment advisor, an RIA, a registered, or also the word is used as a fiduciary, somebody who is legally required to put your needs ahead of their own. He said, if you go to most parts of the country and you go to a, a butcher shop and you go and you go, I- I'm having dinner with some friends over, what do you suggest? One thing's for sure, whatever they're gonna suggest is gonna be meat. <laughs> because that's all they sell. So they might say, we got some great lamb chops here, or we got this roast that's come from here, or we got this steak that comes down from South America. It's the best stuff, it's the best stuff we got. That's what they're gonna sell you. If you go to a butcher, they're gonna sell you meat. But if you went to a dietitian and you said, um, what's, what should I have for dinner tonight? I'd like to have some meat. They might say, hey buddy, I know you want some meat. But let me just show you something. You got, you're got your cholesterol is getting up. You're going to have a heart attack. Maybe it's time for a little fish for you. Maybe it's time for a little rice. Maybe there's a little more salad for you. So a dietitian will actually tell you what's best for you because they're not getting paid to sell meat. They're getting paid for their advice versus a broker is a butcher. Their job is, sincerely, to sell you the best meat they think they have. But you got to remember... There's an organization deciding what meat to sell you and how they can make the most profit from it. So when I watched this video, I was really intrigued. I thought it was such a simple way of describing it. It said what a fiduciary is, a registered investment advisory, an RIA, a fiduciary, is someone you go to who is required by law to make sure what they get you is best for you. The broker has a different rule, and the rule is called suitability standard. I know this sounds like legalese, but you gotta understand this because if you don't, you're gonna take advantage of. Here's what that means. Suitable just means they asked you some questions, they heard your goals, and that they think that what they're offering you could help you get your goals. There's no way you're gonna sue somebody over the suitability standard and say they didn't take care of me, it's not gonna happen. So, interestingly enough, I'll give you a perfect example. Like, suitability is the lowest standard you can imagine. If Somebody has a suitability standard, they tell you to buy Apple this morning or Microsoft or whatever, IBM, and they sell you that stock, and then later in the day, they buy it cheaper, no problem. They won. But if someone's a fiduciary, if they're a registered investment advisory, and they represent your best interest, they legally, if they told you to buy Apple or Microsoft, and you bought it this morning, and they buy it cheaper tonight, they have to give you their stock. It's required by law. They have to put your interests ahead of their own. You would think that everyone would be legally responsible to put their interests behind yours, make you first. But in the financial industry, it's not that way. And there have been huge pushes by Congress to try to bring the fiduciary standard to all financial people. And the financial system has fought it off with big dollars and big lobbyists. So you have to understand this. So one of the things that I really try to do is say, okay, In my book, I'm showing you what to do, but I wanted to be able to say, okay, if you feel like you want someone to do this for you, where do you go? You do not want to go to a broker, even if they're a good guy. As Ray Dalio said, you think that broker is your doctor and he isn't your doctor. He might be sincere, he might care, he might even done okay for a while, but he's not a gold medalist and he's not gonna know where to put your money and he's gonna be selling you what he's supposed to sell you. It's part of a boilerplate, boilerplate, part of a room. So when I watched that little video on the dietitian, you know, versus the, the, the beef salesman, so to speak, the butcher, I found out that the founder of that particular company, uh, the man who did it behind it, was the head of a company called Hightower. And Hightower is right now the 13th fastest growing company in the United States in Inc. Magazine. And it's also the fifth largest registered investment advisory in the world. And they have uh, 30 billion, with a B, dollars worth of assets. And I noticed, I went to meet this man, I interviewed him, and he started telling me stories about what happens in the system that just made me crazy. He said, Tony, here's the common thing people will do. They'll say, I'll do all your investments for the stock market, for equities, for 1%, and I'll do all your bonds for free. He said, Tony, it's not free. They just don't charge you a commission. And he started walking me through this stuff called bond math, where you might be paying 6% or 6 points on something you thought you are paying nothing for. So I, I started pitch and catch with this man, and Elliot is just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And so after we spent hours and hours together, I said to him, 
Elliot, I said, your job, what you've done as I understand at Hightower is you're taking care of ultra wealthy people and you're coming in and you're showing them what all the fees really are and you're eliminating all the fees. You're not taking the profit. You're just delivering services for a fee, for a percentage. He said, that's right. I said, why aren't you doing that for the average person? He goes, Tony, I'd love to. He said, you know, the, the system is, is messed up and you know, there's no transparency. He said, it's just, you know, you just can't do it profitably with people because it takes so much time to service somebody. And if you're taking a tiny percentage, like 1% or less of their, of their assets as a fee, you know, 95 basis points, less than 1% or less. He said, you need somebody who has a lot of money for the time you do it. I said, I understand that. But I said, the average person is getting screwed. They have no idea what they're paying for in fees. They have no idea how much risk they're really taking. They don't even know what their real return is. Someone's telling me an average return. He said, I know. I said, you should do this. I said, even if you don't make money, you should do this and you should use technology. Because you could get today, instead of using a human being's brain taking hours to do that, you could do this with technology. And I basically pitched him on saying, I want you to go and think about this and think about how to bring the level of advice you give to ultra wealthy people to the average person. What was really cool is he felt the spirit of it and we built a real great relationship and over the next three months he went back and worked with his teams and he finally came back and he said tony i introduced him to some people that had some patented technology that was extraordinary i have no investment in it i wasn't selling it i just said these guys are the best i connected with him he said i need somebody just to be my partner i need a a chief investment officer that's somebody that's really brilliant so that we don't just have technology, but we have people on the ground that can help people as well. And he said, I'd like to find a way to partner with him. So I introduced him to a man named AJ Gupta from Stronghold Financial Services. And Stronghold Financial is a great organization. In fact, I know they're great because uh, he's had he's been my registered investment advisor for my family for almost seven years. And he's done amazing things for my family. So I introduced the two of them together. And they got together, took their decades worth of experience. And by the way, uh, AJ Gupta was picked by um, uh, Charles Schwab this last year, and they made him the cover, the example, if you would, the, of the best of the best of the 10,000 registered investment advisors. So he's kind of the face of registered investment advisors in the ad you'll see for Charles Schwab, because Charles Schwab was so impressed by AJ. So I got AJ together along with Elliot pushed them really hard, and they put together what's called Stronghold Financial. And if you go to strongholdfinancial.com, they built the site where within seconds, you can put in your accounts, and it'll pull all of them together, and it'll tell you three things for you. It'll number one, tell you immediately, what are your real costs of what you're doing? Like, what are the real expenses? And it'll show those costs so you know what they cost versus what you could have got it for. It shows it right there so you know what your expenses are. And the second thing it does is it shows you what your level of risk is. Because a lot of people are taking a level of risk they don't even, they're not even aware of. And then thirdly, it shows you what your return has been over the last 10 or 15 years for whatever you've invested in, your real return. And then lastly, it shows you, it compares if you would have invested in something else, like a different example, portfolio, including one designed by Ray Dalio, the man who has, the man who created the fund I told you about in the first video that's been 85% successful, made money 85% of the time, tracking back, backtracking it to literally 75 years. And a man that's, you know, he's made in his own funds, in his alpha fund, he's made 21% per year for 23 straight years. So he designed a fund you'll learn about in the book later on, or a portfolio, I should say. So it shows you how you're doing compared if you did that, what the risk level is, what the return is. So it's kind of like, 
uh, looking under the hood of your broker. And so I'm really excited. Now, why would they do, oh, by the way, when you're all done, you get to see all this and it's free. And you can now go take that information and you can go invest on your own, do it yourself. Or you say, look, I'd like these guys to become my rich investment advisor and you can click one button and you can become a client and they charge you less than 1% to manage all that you do and they bring you other types of, of elements as well. And when I say it's less than 1%, the more money you have, the lower it gets, just like any other registered investment advisor. So uh, I'm really proud of helping to kind of put this together. These guys are bringing conflict-free advice to you and you're on your own to be able to go apply it or you can work with them. I have no vested interest in this, I could have. Uh, they offered me a third of the company for bringing this together and instead I said, you take what you would have given me, that third, and I want you to put it into financial literacy and to feeding people, my passion. So that's what they're doing. I am going to work with them on the ultra wealthy side at some point here with helping people of that nature because if I help those people, they have the money and they can afford it and I, I can participate in that process. So. I'm real proud of what it is, and you can go to literally to strongholdfinancial.com and you can begin to test this out for yourself if you'd like. So just think about this though, more than a third of workers in this country, a third of baby boomers have less than $1,000 saved for retirement. And when you look at things like that, when you look at the fact that 77% of Americans say they have financial stress, but they don't have a plan. What these guys have done at Stronghold is they're basically showing you how to create a plan in minutes. And that plan that you might have spent a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars for, now you can take and just do it on your own. So why are they doing this, by the way? Not to hard to figure out it's the right thing to do, but they're also not stupid. What do we talk about? The secret to wealth is do more for others than anybody else. And the wealthy people that they normally manage, they didn't start out wealthy. So they're hoping that if they take care of you now, you get stuff for free. But as time goes by, you'll probably remember them and become a client and then hopefully a lifelong client and a raving fan. And that's how they're going to build their business. Um, by the way, you might say, well, Tony, is Stronghold the only place I can go? Of course not. What you want to do is go get yourself a registered investment advisor. Now you can, by the way, you can do all this yourself. You don't have to have an RIA. But if you want some advice, you want somebody who's required by law to be on your side. And the only thing I'm going to tell you is this, uh, I've included in the book the website for uh, registered investment advisors all over the country. So I want you to be clear, you don't have to go to the guys at Stronghold to do that. But in the book I give you five things to evaluate to know whether or not they're qualified or not. And I would tell you that not all financial planners are equal. In fact, I'll tell you a statistic that's crazy. Um, and I have this in the book and you can see the actual study, it's crazy. 46% of financial planners have no retirement plan. That's right. 2,400 financial planners were actually surveyed anonymously in a 2013 study by the Financial Planning Association and close to half say they don't practice what they preach. Now that's crazy. Now to be fair to them, the world is so complex right now, many people don't know what to do. So if you're gonna get a fiduciary Think of them two ways. I think of it as two measurements you want, like a cross. First thing I want to know is, are they really a fiduciary? On this side, like, you know, to the left is people that are just salesmen. The middle line here is where legally they're required to take care of me, and some people are trained to be a better fiduciary than others, like your lawyer, your accountant, they're a strong fiduciary. They're only going to do what's in your interest required by law, and a very strong fiduciary will do the same. But you can be a strong fiduciary, and we got to measure something else. Are you really sophisticated? Do you have some of the best choices? Do you know investments where I can make uh, a return, for example, where I'm guaranteed not to lose money in the stock market and still get 80% or 90% of the upside? Very few do. Do you know, for example, how I can invest in senior housing where I might get a 7% return and 50% of the upside? You know, to know what other types of investments are available, I need somebody more sophisticated versus less sophisticated. You can have a fiduciary who's really looking out for your interest, but they're not very sophisticated. They're a good person, but they don't know much. Or you can get a fiduciary that knows a lot. The wealthy have high, high, high sophisticated people. Some can take advantage of, but the smartest ones have fiduciaries as well. So that's like Hightower. Our goal is move you from left up to right, if you will, to where you have high sophistication and high fiduciary. And that's one of the things we try to do here with Stronghold to bring some of those resources down for you. But again, you pick who you want. All I'm gonna tell you here in the end is make sure 
that whoever's going to represent you is on your side legally, not just in sincere, not just they care, you want a fiduciary. Okay? So we covered a whole lot in this session. My gosh, <laughs> we covered four of the lies. Quick review. Number one, you know the first of the seven steps now. You know that the bottom line to getting into getting to financial freedom is you got to tap the power of compounding. You got to become an investor and owner in American stock market or in stocks and bonds. You got to become an investor, period. Real estate, whatever. You can't just be a consumer. And the way you do that is you pick a percentage, you automate it, and you start building a freedom fund. Have you done that first step? If you haven't, when you close this, go to Fidelity, go to Schwab, find a way to automate and take a percentage off that's going to be automated every month where you don't see the money. Two, this session, become an insider. you got to become an insider. You've got to know the rules of the game before you get in. Rule number one, nobody beats the market long term. Get yourself an index if you're going to be in those markets. And there's all kinds of indexes you'll learn. There's real estate indexes, not just stock markets. What you want to do, number two, is fees do matter. You don't want to be paying a ton of fees. You want to be in that 1% range or below, not 2 and 3%, or maybe even less than 1% if you're just doing it all yourself and you have a small amount. Take a look at your 401ks. In the book, I have a whole chapter on 401ks. It's really simple. And if you're an owner, you better read it because... Most owners don't realize they're the fiduciary. You're responsible legally to your people to make sure your plan is the best. And if it's not, you can be fined $600,000. Take a look at the book. It'll get your full attention. You're required by law each year to compare your 401k to the best of the best. And if you don't do that, you're exposed by the Department of Labor. Anyway, important piece, 401ks. Third, don't get sucked into average returns. Up, down, up, down, looks even. You're down 43.75% on that same example. Going up 50, down 50, up 50, down 50. So you're not going to get seduced. Fourth, even if you like your broker, even if they got a beautiful name like wealth manager, make sure who's representing you is a fiduciary. You don't want a suitable investment. How do you feel if somebody said, let's go have a, let's go have a meal there. The food's suitable. Or what if you said, honey, how was the sex tonight? Well, it was suitable. <laughs> you don't want that. You want the best. You want somebody on your side. You want fiduciary, baby. You don't want a butcher. You want a dietitian. Am I making sense? I hope this session's been helpful to you. I uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. This uh, video has been designed to be part of this initial series, but I'm going to expand this series as time goes by. And if you're interested, you can find out more in the future. But right now, all the answers you need are in your book, Money, Master the Game, those seven simple steps to financial freedom. Take them now, begin them now, take these first two steps, and you'll be on the fast track to the wealth you deserve. Thanks for letting me participate. I hope you come online and communicate what you think of our programs, and I hope I someday get to meet you in person real soon. Live strong and live with passion.